me welcome everyone um, to the annual, what we try to make annual, um, Loyola lecture. I wanted to say that it's been a very long time since I've seen some of your faces, but for some of you, I am only seeing your names, but that is, um, that is good enough. I'm not trying to guilt you into um, joining via video. Um, we're going to be running it mostly as a, as a webinar for the first part um, of the lecture. And that is, you can definitely um, keep your audio and your video off while you're listening. Um, and, but we hope that you will rejoin us um, for the Q&A um, at the very end. So let me recover my notes. Um, and so, um, sorry. So the Loyola lecture is uh, this year um, has been co-organized by the Faculty of Arts and Sciences and the Department of Philosophy. Um, and we're featuring Father Luis Caruana, who is currently serving um, as Fordham's Loyola chair. The St. Ignatius Loyola chair offers Jesuits from the US and around the world the opportunity to serve as a distinguished professor, contributing to and enhancing the Catholic and Jesuit tradition of our university. It offers the Fordham academic community an opportunity in turn to connect to the depths and breadth of research carried out by Jesuit scholars across the globe. And I am delighted today that we are able to host Father Luis Caruana, who is a Jesuit priest, a philosophy professor at the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome, and a scholar at the Vatican Observatory. Father Caruana started his education with degrees in mathematics and physics, and then proceeded to master's degrees in philosophy in London and in theology in Paris. Um, he obtained his PhD from the Department of History and Philosophy of Science, at the University of Cambridge. His previous service includes a six-year term of office as faculty dean, um, so my heart goes out, and a seven-year period of teaching and research at Heathrop College, University of London, where he was appointed reader in 2003. He also spent time as a research scholar at the University of Notre Dame um, in 2009 and at the Australian National University in 2015. Fabra Caruana's research deals with the interaction between philosophy of science, metaphysics, and philosophy of religion, and his publications include three monographs, um, Holism and the Understanding of Science, Science and Virtue, and Nature, Its Conceptual Architecture. He's also the contributing editor of two interdisciplinary volumes, Darwin and Catholicism, and The Beginning and End of the Universe. Fabra Caruana's lecture today is entitled Exploring Conceptual Plasticity, Should We Attribute Legal Personality to Intelligent Machines? There will be a Q&A after the lecture, so please um, feel free to raise your blue hands or contribute via chat, um, and we will uh, make sure that as many questions as possible um, are brought to the foreground. So warm welcome to Fabra Caruana. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. I'll start by um, sharing my screen. So be patient, please, for a moment. Well, thank you very much. Dean Badowska for the introduction. It is certainly an honor for me to be the holder of the Loyola Chair for this semester. And I thank the organizers and Fordham University in general for this unique and wonderful opportunity. Despite the COVID-19 restrictions, I am appreciating every minute of my time here at the Rose Hill campus and would like to thank also the Spellman Hall Jesuit community for their wonderful hospitality. I will start my lecture now by mentioning a, sa a sad event. On June 29th, five years ago, 2015, a 22-year-old worker at a car factory in Frankfurt, in Germany, was killed by a robot. This is not the only case of a person being seriously injured or killed by a robot. Who is responsible when such things happen? Given that nowadays robots have decision-making capabilities, some people are convinced 
that in such incidents, the one we should hold responsible is the robot. Does this make sense? Is it just a move to facilitate legal procedures? A few months after that Frankfurt incident, the Committee on Legal Affairs for the European Parliament produced a draft report in which we find the, the proposal that robots be recognized as legal persons. In its exact wording, the proposal was to create, quote, a specific legal status for robots, so that at least the most sophisticated autonomous robots could be established as having the status of electronic persons with specific rights and obligations, end of quote. The European Parliament adopted this proposal as a resolution on civil law rules for robotics. The resolution represents a new extension of the notion of legal personhood, and if approved as law, would probably have very significant consequences for the future. The entire issue deals not only with the level of machine sophistication, but also with our own self-understanding. The questions it raises branch out in various directions involving neuroscience, cognitive science, philosophy of mind, ethics, legal theory, and even theological anthropology. In recent decades, research in artificial intelligence and robotics has had, in fact, a significant impact. Researchers have studied the implications from various angles. The Vatican as well, has contributed to these studies, especially through two high-profile workshops organized jointly by the Pontifical Academy of Sciences and the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences. In all these studies, scholars have focused on the specific question of attributing legal person personhood to sophisticated machines. But one area remains somewhat ignored, namely the, the semantic dimension of the problem. In this lecture, I will explore this particular area, dealing with meaning. The general aim is to examine the complex problem by determining what is happening at the level of meaning. The lecture has three parts. The first presents the relevant historical background, the second part reviews the current debate as regards the applicability of legal status to intelligent machines. The third section then pushes the debate a little forward by exploring the area of semantics. The first section. The relation between the mind and the body has been the object of philosophical and religious speculation for centuries, probably since the dawn of history. Plato, in his book Phaedo, famously defended a clear distinction between soul and body, considering the body a kind of prison from which the soul seeks liberation. The body is corruptible, but the soul, since it grasps mathematical and other kinds of necessary truths, is immortal. Aristotle adopted a different method and drew inspiration from biology. He saw the relation between soul and body as a special case of the more general relation between form and matter, between mover and moved. He recognized from the start that the question of the soul's location within the body is misguided. Soul being the form of the natural body or the principle of animal life has no specific location within the body in this sense, form is similar to shape, let's say. To have a soul is not to possess something or to be related to something, but to be or to exist in a specific way. Notice therefore how Aristotle's analysis of the soul was primarily conceptual, not empirical. For him, the soul was certainly not some material constituent of the person. A major turning point occurred in the 17th century through the work of René Descartes, who proposed that as regards explanation, we need to assume that non-human animals, 
are machines. Humans, on the contrary, are made up of two kinds of substance. The extended substance, the machine, and the thinking type of substance, the mind. Despite, despite these clear distinctions, Descartes saw that as regards humans, naive dualism could not be the right answer. Human reality is more complicated. He wrote, for instance, quote, nature teaches me that I am not only lodged in my body as a pilot in his vessel, but that apart from this, I am so closely united and intermingled with it that I compose with it one whole. This is Descartes' caution. However, it went unheeded and his distinctions took root in academia and generated a form of science-inspired dualism that is still with us today. Consider, for instance, the development of neuroscience from the 18th century onwards. One of Descartes' conjectures was that the crucial location where the non-material mind interacts with the body was the part of the brain called the pineal gland. Descartes' interest in this question represents a new research project, namely the project of determining those parts of the brain that are responsible for specific intellectual and physical activities. Eventually, this project came to be called the theory of cortical localization. The first attempt to map the brain in this way could not, of course, resort, resort to human vivisection. It started rather by assuming that the localization of mental function resulted in outward physical manifestations. Researchers like Franz Josef Gall, the originator of the now obsolete discipline of phrenology, assumed that bumps on the skull correspond to specific mental capacities, some enhanced more than others, in line with the character of that individual person. This idea of external manifestation was eventually disproved. Nevertheless, the determination of cortical localization remained a rewarding research project. The fine structure of the cerebral cortex was eventually mapped and our knowledge of the function of cortical sites became increasingly specific, arriving even to the identification of those parts of the brain that are responsible for the move movement of even each finger. Advancing further in microscopic brain anatomy, Neuroscientists discovered the structure and function of this special, a specialized cell of the brain, the neuron. A significant point here is that, as opposed to the higher level localization of the brain, we find no localization at the neuron level. In other words, we find no one-one correspondence between neuron and brain function and certainly none between neuron, a single neuron, and bodily function. We find rather collaboration of many neurons or cell assemblies for any specific function. To explain brain anatomy at the cell level, therefore, we need a holistic approach. Up to now, this quick historical overview has highlighted the path of inquiry regarding the study of the brain's role in human physical and mental functions. This, however, is not the only line of inquiry worth mentioning here. There is another long line of inquiry regarding simulation. The main question in this second line of inquiry has been how can we simulate what humans do intellectually? Simulation starts with the construction of simple instruments. For instance, the construction of a spade that in a sense simulates and extends our capacity to dig with our hands. As regards thinking, the first steps were taken, were taken in ancient times with the construction of instruments that helped calculation like the abacus. Progress continued with the construction of sophisticated mechanical adding machines like, like Blaise Pascal's mechanical calculator. 
invented in the early 17th century. With the advent of electronics, the second half of the 20th century saw the rapid development of digital computers. Current machines can simulate many human intellectual abilities. They can respond correctly to human speech, compete successfully at high level strategic games like chess. They can operate cars autonomously and so on. Where are we today? The question regarding legal personhood attribution to machines emerges forcefully because intelligent machines have now become capable of simulating more and more human intellectual skills. Consider, for instance, what researchers call expert systems. These are software designs that simulate not just a normal person of average intelligence, but they simulate the expert. They simulate the expert's ability to offer a dependable judgment regarding a specific course of action to be taken. Thus, they simulate the person who is capable of making a valuable judgment because of his or her long experience. The machine can simulate this by referring to a vast amount of stored data. In a sense, like a human being, it can experience, understand and then judge. This artificial capability became possible primarily when researchers started to model the machine hardware on the brain's neuronal structure. They called the new structure an artificial neural network. You can think of an artificial neural network as a number of points in space with connections between them. The points or units of the network are simple processors and are usually situated in a number of distinct layers. The connections between units of one layer with units of the next layer are extremely numerous and are not all of the same strength. Information passes from one layer to another, from processor to processor, but the itinerary of information as it passes through the entire network is not linear. It is not along a single line made up of connection from one node to another node to another node. On the contrary, the information is spread out, it is distributed, it passes along various connection pathways involving many nodes at the same time. This kind of parallel distributed programming has interesting properties. For instance, the input layer and the output layer are connected to the outside world, precisely because the former receives the information and the latter delivers it. The, layer, the layers in between, however, are not connected to the outside world. Engineers who construct the network never know for sure what is happening within these hidden intermediate layers. Moreover, this kind of distributed programming can simulate high level human intellectual abilities such as learning. We use the expression machine learning when the networks program themselves for some specific task. Engineers will give the network a training period during which they expose it to a sample of input-output pairs. For example, a network may be given the chance to learn how to recognize words as they are spoken by a person with a particular accent. In this case, the training period consists of the person reading a standard text into the system. The standard text constitutes a set of input-output pairs to standardize the network. The network then can work and expand its detecting ability on its own. It can learn on its own. The significant point for us in this lecture is that the engineers who build the network will never know exactly how its hidden layers become standardized for this specific task. Move on to, we move on now to our, my second section. Machine expertise has greatly encouraged people to describe machines by using specifically human personal attributes. Without any hesitation, we now describe a computer as remembering, thinking, understanding and deciding. Apparently, the fact that such verbs are attributable to humans and only rarely to some animals does not worry us. In our vocabulary, machines 
have now been promoted, as it were, from being mere things to being autonomous agents. This new status of the machine has important consequences as regards responsibility. I start this lecture by recalling the sad incident of the worker who was killed by a robot. Had the man been killed accidentally by a falling branch during a storm, we would not hold anyone responsible. But because the killing was caused by an entity that enjoyed a certain degree of independence, we are tempted to see the killing as caused by an agent. No one knows what was going on inside its circuitry, not even its creators. The machine therefore enjoyed a certain degree of privacy and autonomy. This seems to indicate that it could have a personal status with respect to the law. What is at stake here? The idea of a legal person is not new. It arose from the awareness that a combined group of people could, in certain circumstances, act in a way that is impossible for any one of its members on his or her own. Because of this, the law could recognize the group as a legal entity or a legal person. On this point, jurisdictions are not all in full agreement, but they all agree that when we are not referring to a human being, a legal person is a legal fiction. We use it because it facilitates legal reasoning. We should not forget, however, that as a fiction, it could function well in some areas and not so well in others. The insufficiency of the idea often emerges when things go wrong and we need to ask who is responsible for the damage done. For lack of time, I will focus on one important area only, the link between responsibility and autonomy. In what sense could a machine be responsible before the law? Responsibility and autonomy go hand in hand. Consider, for instance, the case of robots or drones used in war. In the near future, highly sophisticated autonomous weapons will probably be entrusted with decisions about target identification and destruction. Increasing machine autonomy in warfare could push humans out of the picture completely. We all agree that in the manufacture and the initiation of such intelligent machines, many humans are involved. Nevertheless, if we accept that the machine enjoys a degree of autonomy, we cannot automatically hold these humans responsible for the machine's action. The higher the degree of machine autonomy, the less justification we have for holding one of these people responsible. Notice how we reason in the same way when dealing with children. We hold parents responsible for minor children. When children grow up, they become autonomous and hence the parents are not responsible any longer. The degree of autonomy therefore determines who is, who is responsible and this principle seems applicable to intelligent machines. Of course, we are not saying here that minor children are not persons until they grow up. We are exploring how we attribute responsibility and it seems that we sometimes resort, resort consciously or unconsciously to the idea of a quasi-agent. Although the law does not explicitly say so, it considers minor children as quasi-agents. They do not enjoy the full rights of personhood. They cannot, for instance, sign a contract. Nevertheless, they are protected just like adults. Legal agency, therefore, can apply in an attenuated form to entities that fall short of personhood in the full sense. Applying this idea to intelligent machines, some people argue that even if technical progress will never reproduce a fully fledged person, we may still eventually arrive at a situation in which machines will be quasi agents in the legal sense. 
The basic point, therefore, seems to be that the concepts of personal agency, responsibility, and autonomy allow for degrees. Admittedly, we often assume that personal agency is either present or absent. We often assume that it is present when the entities that cause the action are fully autonomous. It is absent when the entities that cause the action are causally determined, when the entities enjoy no or very little autonomy, like non-human animals or minor children. This assumption, however, neglects the fact that even with no reference to intelligent machines, we sometimes acknowledge an intermediate conceptual space between autonomous and non-autonomous agents. This space is occupied by entities that are partially autonomous. An entity can be called partially autonomous when those who launch it into action know clearly what ends the entity is meant to achieve, but they cannot foresee the action that the entity will use to achieve it. We could argue, therefore, that to determine the responsibility for damage caused by an intelligent machine used, let's say, as a weapon, we would need to resort to this intermediate conceptual space. We should think of autonomous weapon systems as partially autonomous and hence as quasi-agents. Some people ask, is the idea of punishment relevant here? For some researchers, attributing legal personhood to a machine does not make sense, even if we were to hold it responsible. The main reason is that the machine cannot be punished. For punishment to be possible, the subject needs to have a moral psychology that is open to the burdens of duties and temptations. Corporations do qualify, but only in the sense that the punishment transfers to the human owners of the corporation. So, does this brief overview of the main arguments allow us to detect some general trends? I started my lecture by quoting from the 2016 proposal at the European, European Parliament, where we find the suggestion that the law should start recognizing a specific legal status for robots. The debate so far has not made it clear how the granting of legal personality to intelligent machines could be of benefit. This 2016 proposal and its eventual adoption as a resolution, in fact, created a robust reaction from various quarters. A joint statement with more than 150 signatories expressed a strong opposition to the conferring of any form of legal status to intelligent machines. Their argument depends on two main points. First, the proposal to confer legal status to robots was founded on the idea that in the near future, quote, damage liability would be impossible to prove. According to these critics, this is totally incorrect. Secondly, the proposal errs because it contains quote, an overvaluation of actual capacities of even the most advanced robots. This overvaluation is the result of science fiction and sensational press releases. The signatories of this open letter express their expert judgment that all intelligent machines, even when very sophisticated, make decisions that can always be traced back to human agents as regards responsibility. The conclusion of this paper is therefore that, quote, creating a legal status of electronic person would be ideological and nonsensical and non-pragmatic. Caution is expressed in a similar way by the US Department of Defense when discussing le lethal autonomous weapon systems. The policy is that, quote, autonomous and semi-autonomous weapon systems shall be designed to allow commanders and operators to exercise appropriate levels of human judgment over the use of force. The human element should not be obscured or eliminated. We come now to my third and final section. Let us now try to, to unveil 
what is happening at the semantic level. In these debates, we rightly assume that personhood, at least in the legal sense, means the capacity to enjoy rights and perform duties. We also assume that for these capacities, one needs awareness and free will. Since intelligent machines have no capacity for awareness, we conclude that attributing legal personhood to them is incorrect. Can a philosophical opponent challenge this reasoning? Suppose engineers will add some new sophisticated module to current machines and then announce that by convention, the meaning of capacity for awareness should also include such machines with this added unit. Should we accept this? The answer to this question in the light of recent philosophical advances regarding the theory of meaning, it seems best to start with the collaborative work of Max Bennett, a neuroscience scientist, and Peter Hacker, a prominent Wittgenstein scholar. These two authors are concerned about the way some cognitive neuroscientists and artificial intelligence engineers are using personal attributes to describe their observations and achievements. The problem they see is semantic, has to do with meaning. What is the basic starting point? The basic starting point is that the meaning of a word is not arbitrary. A word's meaning is its specific use within the complex social life of language users. This use is governed by rules. Consider the analogy between language and the game of chess. The chess pieces are used according to rules, rules that determine the game. For the game to be possible, the rules need to be fixed and accepted by both players. The same happens in language. The rules of grammar determine the correct use of words. These rules do not determine what is said, but are accepted by all language users for language to be possible. Now, the specific problem related to machine intelligence arises because some important verbs like desiring, intending, thinking and understanding function fully and correctly only when their subject is a human person. Despite this, some scientists <clears throat> and technicians freely use these verbs when the subject is just the brain or just a computer. Bennett and Hacker show convincingly that this incorrect use can cause confusion. They start from the obvious point that to attribute a specific thought to someone, we resort to that person's behavior characteristics. When that person's behavior is of a certain kind, for instance, when she picks up her umbrella before going out for a walk, then we rightly say she thinks it might rain. These behavioral features are part of the complex social interaction of the person with the environment, an interaction that might, might also include, of course, role play or deception. Of course, a brain on its own, as distinct from the person, cannot show any such behavioral features. Brains are such, as such, do not move around. They are not socially engaged. Admittedly, the brain very probably has some features that depend on whether that person thinks it might rain or not. But the one who thinks is the entire person, not just the brain. First, we determine what the person thinks, and then we study the brain not the other way around. Obliv oblivious to these fundamental principles, some scientists st still describe the results of their research by speaking about the brain's thinking and reasoning and so on. Are we dealing here with a harmless metaphor? Well, it seems not. When people do this, they assume that we could separate the concept of person with all its connotations regarding thinking, reasoning, and understanding, from the social relationality that that concept involves. This assumption, however, leads inevitably to confusion, precisely because the concept of person is essentially 
connected to relationality. When faced with the question whether an entity before us is a person or not, we first need to apply biological criteria to ascertain that we are dealing with a genuine living thing. Then we apply intelligence criteria to ascertain that we are dealing with an intelligent organism. Finally, we need to apply personal criteria to see whether we are dealing with a personal organism or another form of intelligent organism. And especially this last step involves observing the kind of social relations that organism has with others. Using Ludwig Wittgenstein's vocabulary, we could express this point by saying that words like aware or conscious refer to attributes that depend on the form of life. A computer as such does not have a form of life. Someone may object perhaps by saying that machines nowadays can indeed include processes that correspond to human behavior. Some machines may make use of biological material and so on. More in line with intelligence, these people may say, well, remind us that machines can answer questions typed on a screen or spoken into a microphone. And therefore these machines do resemble the human form of life. But this resemblance is minimal when compared to the vast array of social behaviors that we need as a criterion for the correct use of important wor words like awareness or consciousness. In this area, the idea of resemblance is very important. Think of a non-human entity with a specific form of life. How close to ours must that form of life be for that entity to deserve the status of personhood? Our recognition of resemblance is a complex process. It involves holistic perception and does not always Im imply prior knowledge of precise, necessary and sufficient conditions. Wittgenstein's expression family resemblance is very appropriate because it highlights how we re recognize resemblance in a holistic fashion and not point by point. A lack of resemblance as regards one aspect may be compensated by resemblance as regards another. The classic Turing test involves resemblance as regards linguistic skills only. The machine is designated to generate human-like responses for questions set by an evaluator. If the evaluator cannot tell the machine from the human, according to the test, the machine is said to have passed the test. The machine is said to merit the attribute intelligent. Is it not obvious, however, that this is a very reductionistic approach? From the innumerable behavior patterns that characterize human rationality, we pick just one element. And this leads inevitably to a biased conclusion as regards personhood. To avoid this, we need to adopt a holistic approach, one that considers not only linguistic skills, but also all other kinds of behavior, including thereby the entire form of life. This is what family resemblance involves. As things are today, an intelligent machine may indeed pass the Turing test, but still fail to pass the family resemblance test. It will not pass because it does not behave like an intelligent organism in the broad sense. Consider how our understanding functions as regards living things. For instance, dogs. Since dogs can neither read, write, nor speak, they will certainly not pass the Turing test. They are therefore definitely unlike humans. Their outward behavior, however, compensates for this lack of resemblance. That is why we rightly attribute to them some personal attributes in a derived sense and can even understand what they communicate with their various sounds. These arguments point clearly to the following conclusion. It is not true that if an entity functions like a person in some restricted sense, for example, as regards linguistic skills only, then it, it deserves personal. This conclusion 
is an invitation for us to retrieve the richness of pre-Cartesian philosophical anthropology. Before Descartes, the majority view was that the person is not made up of two separate substances, body and soul, but is on the contrary, a unity that can be appreciated both from the material viewpoint and from the intellectual or spiritual viewpoint. This is the valuable heritage of Aristotle and Aquinas. The specifically human form of life, which we use as a criterion for the correct attribution of personhood, includes being related in two ways. It needs to have endosomatic relations, that is, relations between one part of the body and another part of the body. It needs also exosomatic relations, relations connecting the entity to things outside it. The brain functions not on its own, but in constant symbiosis with the entire body. Likewise, the person, the unity of mind and body, operates not on its own, but in constant symbiosis with the entire social and cultural space that makes rationality possible. To appreciate better the benefits of the position defended, def I defend, it is helpful to consider a major philosophical objection that has been leveled against it. Philosopher Daniel Dennett has criti criticized this position severely by arguing that semantic rules of grammar seem fixed, but are not really so. For him, these rules are nothing more than collective habits. They are nothing more than the result of human interaction with the environment over millennia, rules that ensure a stable and useful production of human sounds. He disagrees with those who see grammatical rules as logically compelling. For him, the entire network of rules is just a feature of human social life. When radical changes occur within society, some of these rules may be revised to achieve better overall efficiency. Then it is moreover convinced that the emergence of highly intelligent and autonomous machines represents precisely such a radical change that demands a revision. It justifies, according to him, the use of expressions that we have traditionally banned, expressions like this machine understands or this machine is a person. This criticism in, in its apparent defense of human freedom as regards the use of words may seem attractive. Nevertheless, it rests on, on an oversight. For any scientist, the sense of a hypothesis must be settled before he or she could determine whether that hypothesis is true or false. For a string of words to make sense, one needs to respect a set of rules. Only then can scientists conduct their inquiry to decide about the truth or falsity of what is proposed. If some people want to change the rules regarding the word person, they need to realize that such a change generates conceptual repercussions elsewhere. When the rule is revised, it will produce a ripple effect that could go right across the entire conceptual landscape an effect that may cause confusion. The new rules, for instance, have detrimental effects on the use of that same word in everyday contexts. For instance, calling a machine a person disrupts our association of the word person with ethical demands, like respecting persons, recognizing their dignity and their existential and religious aspirations and so forth. So people like Dennett need to re-establish consistency across the entire range of human experience and not only in their own specialized semantic space. Probably Dennett and his followers will not find this argument compelling. They could claim that such links between descriptive and normative or moral expressions are not as untouchable as we are assuming they will probably argue that it is perfectly possible to tear apart the conceptual fabric right there on the fault line between thinking and respecting as a person. 
if we start using personal attributes without their ethical overtones, what would happen then? In that case, the situation will be like changing the rules of an established game. Suppose we start playing chess and then we decide to change the rules. Would we still be playing chess? Given that the game is defined in terms of its rules, the answer is no. We would have introduced a new game or a new type of chess. We would have chess according to the old rules and chess according to the new rules, two separate games. Analogously, a change in semantic and grammatical rules would produce a complex situation in which a word means one thing in one context and another thing in another context. For instance, that word would have ethical implications in one context and no ethical implications in another. Both contexts would enjoy internal consistency, but the speaker would need to acquire the skill of switching from one context to the other. This leads to fragmentation of language and even eventually fragmentation of culture itself, as described by um, Jean-Francois Lyotard in his study of postmodernism. Is this a healthy way forward for humanity? As faster communication, more efficient travel and global concerns are helping us to grow into a global community, favoring the conditions for the realization of a truly universal family. It will be self-defeating to encourage fragmentation at the conceptual level. Could we perhaps just wait and see what happens? In the name of new technology, we inflict conceptual lacerations onto the semantic fabric that was meant to keep our understanding as self-consistent as possible. Could we just perhaps wait for these lacerations to heal on their own? Some researchers have indeed advocated such an approach, which we could call pragmatic. Lawrence Solon, for instance, seems to argue that we do not need to waste our time now to figure out beforehand whether we should attribute legal personhood to intelligent machines in the future. When the time comes, when machines will reach a higher level of intelligence and autonomy, when machines will have a will of their own, well, then, Solom argues, we will see how society reacts. We will see how society adjusts itself. This approach is pragmatic in the sense that it assumes a kind of invisible hand that guides us always towards the optimal situation. It implies that we should concentrate on what works well as regards our immediate needs and should avoid the deeper metaphysical question of whether machines really have awareness, intention and understanding. This assumption may seem reasonable, but in fact is very worrying. It leads to no solution at all. The invisible hand that allegedly guides humanity has not always resulted in the optimal situation, far from it. Without deliberate, responsible and courageous decisions based upon the attentive consideration of the future consequences of our action, chances are that society will just spin out of control and fall into the hands of demagogues. The pragmatic approach, therefore, is not convincing. It cannot revoke the duty to think ahead. It cannot substitute a responsible detailed study of the way shifts of meaning in one area of our conceptual scheme could affect meaning in other areas, causing confused thinking and problematic legal practice. I am not advocating radical semantic con conservatism at any price. I certainly support cultural, technological and intellectual novelty, even though this novelty is nearly always associated with neologisms. What I am advocating is caution and responsibility in this area. Not all neologisms are beneficial, not all neologisms are neutral. Sometimes they can have damaging consequences, even when accepted by the majority. 
conclusion. The intricate set of mutually dependent questions discussed in this lecture constitute, as you must have realized, a broad issue that will be with us for many years ahead. My lecture was limited to a philosophical evaluation of one area only. Philosophy, of course, is no substitute for natural science or for technological innovation. The recent research of cognitive science and robotics has been enormous. The resourcefulness, creativity and care represented by such collaborative research undoubtedly demands respect and admiration. Philosophy here can be a partner with a specific role. Philosophy contributes by being attentive to conceptual links and by identifying any problematic transgressions of the bounds of sense. This lecture, I hope, has been an example of such philosophical work. The overall result can be summarized in two points. First, my lecture showed, I hope, that a very liberal use of personal attributes to describe non-human entities, attributes involving intelligence, understanding, willing, and personhood, is detrimental, especially if we use words univocally. univocally. Negligence in this area undermines conceptual consistency because it disregards particularly important moral implications that these attributes have. Secondly, as regards the specific question of machines as legal persons, the most dangerous aspect seems to be the possible hidden agenda, the possible hidden agenda of wanting the legal machinery to exculpate the real per perpetrators when things go wrong. To be prepared for dealing with wrongs committed by machines, we should not create a legal fiction that could serve as a shelter for wrongdoers. We should rather clarify how responsibility is distributed among the many human agents that may be involved. Blaming the machine is not the way forward. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Faber Caruana, uh, for this extremely important and interesting presentation on one of the truly major issues of our time. Um, we received, I, I understand that you're willing to take a couple of questions. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, there is one in chat and one that we received prior um, to even the start of your lecture via email. So I'll start with that one um, since it arrived to us. Um, and it says this, I will read it exactly. Um, how is the question over legal status of robots a different question from that of the legal status of corporations? How are the two questions similar? Okay, thank you very much um, for such a question because it allows me to explore the similarity between corporations and intelligent machines. The major difference is that for corporations, we can, in fact, link responsibility to the people involved. There is also a space for punishment. Of course, when we deal with a corporation, we in fact have people representing that corporation, uh, signatories and so on. And therefore, of course, uh, we, as we know, corporation can be in a sense liable um, in any kind of wrongdoing. And when we try to apply the same kind of reasoning to machines, we will encounter problems because that is precisely the whole issue. Um, the suggestion of having machines as legal personalities, in fact, seems to be emerging from those who think that there is no way of determining who is responsible. Of course, I mean, if we go forward and think that the machine is just an instrument, as I think should in fact be the case, then, of course, either the manufacturers or the users could, in fact, be considered as liable when things go wrong. And in that sense, we will be, in a sense, um, closer to the idea of corporations. I think that is the major difference. I mentioned briefly also the issue of punishment. And of course, that is um, another clear distinction, because 
um, uh, machines, robots cannot be punished as such. So um, even if we imagine, let's say, an extra module that is used to punish the machine, we all understand that this is nothing really, uh, uh, it's not real punishment. So in a sense, there are people who argue that the attribution of personality to robots is deficient because of punishment as well. Thank you so much. Um, Jude, you had a question um, in chat. Would you like to ask it live? Sure. Um, thank you um, for the Caruana. It's a very stimulating discussion. Um, I found myself um, wandering to the, to the questions raised by the research programs that are underway in several places now, raising the possibility of or seeking desperately to figure out how to upload consciousness to some sort of storage um, mechanism. Um, and so it made me wonder, you know, in that case, we've got something that you could argue is a kind of overlap rather than a resemblance between um, something that's a machine human hybrid and um, the original person. So I'm wondering, it, would you think that those still don't have enough of the um, what you described as the entire form of life or later the unified form of life of the original such that we um, it would have a, a different legal status um, or would that legal status possibly transfer if sufficient identity markers were actually uploaded. I mean, this is speculative, um, but people seem hell bent on getting this to work um, and there's federal grant money going into it. Um, so I'm just wondering, you know, or would they would they still lie at, outside of the, the way the rules work for the current attribution of the status of person or responsibility, et cetera? So I just was curious what your thoughts were about that. Okay, thanks, Jude. It's a very interesting question, of course, and it allows me also to bring in some, some ideas that are parallel to the idea of person, namely consciousness. Now, um, we need to make sure that what we read, of course, is of a certain, as it were, serious nature, because as indicated at one part of my lecture, you know, there's a lot of science fiction going around and most people don't know, as it were, the distinction between them. You may have also, um, you may recall Sof Sophia. Sophia was a robot, a very, very um, uh, human looking robot, a beautiful girl. And she was paraded around actually as being, you know, the final achievement of AI because she could answer all kinds of questions raised by the audience and so on. And she even was um, granted, I think, citizenship by Saudi Arabia. I mean, all this is like um, uh, most serious engineers will, will know that it, all this is show. It's, a, it's an art form, really, an art form, which in this way touches us in specific ways, as it were, to explore how we react to this kind of object in front of us. So I consider Sophia as, Sophia as, as a kind of um, art form that, as it were, brings home the idea of what is consciousness. Now, just um, to link your question to my overall approach, we are certainly dealing with a holistic attribute when you say consciousness. Consciousness, as already indicated by the classical positions, Aristotle and Aquinas. Consciousness is an attribute of the whole. And in fact, in a sense, we, we shouldn't overemphasize its kind of ghostly character, as most of these science fiction um, uh, books or movies usually do, because we use consciousness also as regards animals. Suppose, you know, so the bird hit um, crashed into the window pane and it was unconscious for, for a minute and then woke up again and flew away. So it is perfectly correct to use consciousness in that sense. However, it's a holistic approach to the living thing that we are um, trying to describe. So in that sense, when we talk about uploading consciousness, we are in fact totally within a Cartesian dualistic picture that we are trying uh, this kind of background picture of having the soul and hardware and the mind as software and the mind and consciousness and this kind of uh, this kind of literature is usually the same 
So in a sense, it all depends on that kind of dualism, which is really um, very powerful within most researchers without them knowing. And the, the way we use words sometimes, as I was trying to explain, in fact manifests that the background metaphysical picture is in fact very Cartesian. And uh, I'm afraid it's, it doesn't render us good service that way. So um, just for uh, the, the clincher to answer your question, I, I don't think that there is any future for this kind of uploading consciousness. And um, what may be happening there is an invention, uh, a, uh, a stretching of the concept of consciousness, as I try to, uh, try to do with it in my explaining of personhood, stretching it in a new way. So if the machine does this and this, this, this and the other, then we should call it conscious. And then, of course, we will have to realize that stretching that concept in that way may have very serious repercussions back home, as it were, in our ethical and um, uh, everyday context. Michael Bauer, I think I saw a question from you. Yes, uh, hopefully I can be heard. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, my question has to do really with the, the, the rhetoric uh, behind um, your presentation, because you want to make use of the insights of Wittgenstein and going back further, Aristotle and Aquinas in order to weigh in on this particular contemporary issue. And I'm completely on board with you on that. Um, on the other hand, in order to present the position, you made use of the notion of autonomy. And of course, that's part of the rhetoric anyway of, of uh, the scientific discourse. But I'm wondering whether you'd get more mileage and more traction if you perhaps use that terminology, if you, if you will, but do so by casting a great deal of doubt on it as you're going along, because um, you, you want to move towards a recognition of, of socialization, forms of life within which we already operate, um, and you want to move beyond a dualism. But the, the, the logic, the rhetoric of autonomy, which is broadly Kantian and has its roots in Descartes, um, that, that rhetoric doesn't make much room for socialization. There's no degrees of autonomy in Kant, either it's free or unfree. And there's no degrees of corporeality in our thinking, according to Descartes. So, so it's an either or dualism, which is it cuts against the holism that you want, also cuts against the recognition of socialization in a way of life. So the suggestion is perhaps make use of the word autonomy. That's part of the rhetoric already, but don't imply that you're buying into it. Cause I think a lot of listeners will buy into the dualistic metaphysics without realizing you're actually cutting against it. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. I mean, that's a very um, uh, important point and I certainly um, agree with you. Uh, of course, I included the idea of autonomy because uh, it is one of the major key concepts uh, in, in, the, uh, in the debates. And uh, again, it's another sign that we are, in a sense, situated within a broadly Cartesian, Kantian, if you like, um, background. And as it were, trying to dislodge the debate in another tradition is not always easy. I mean, of course, I suppose the other tradition, Aristotelian, Thomism, and so on, autonomy could be linked to freedom in that sense. And there we can also have grades of freedom. Yeah, uh, d degrees of self-motion versus motion by another. And we're, 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 all, un we're all caused causers. We're all <laughs> moved movers. And, and the rhetoric of autonomy doesn't seem to allow for that. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I, I guess I'm just suggesting that the task is not just one of argumentation, but linguistic rhetorical strategy in the midst of, of the argumentation. Um, we should also recall, of course, the um, legal discourse regarding children. And I think there, this is one of the key concepts. So, again, you see, these kind of reflections are crisscrossing various disciplines together. And the clarification of concepts is very important. Thank you. Let's close the evening with um, a question from Stephen Grimm. Yes, Stephen, how are you? Thank you, Eva. Uh, thank you, Father Caruana. Very interesting talk. Just quickly, on your last point, you're saying that thinking of um, robots as moral agents 
moral agents would be susceptible to blame. And in blaming them, we might be exculpating real wrongdoers, human wrongdoers. The flips, it's true, but being moral agents doesn't just make you liable to blame. It also makes you a candidate for praise. Mm -hmm. So um, another danger, if, if we think of these robots as genuine moral agents, is that we would be, if we fail to appreciate them as genuine moral agents, we'd be depriving them of deserved praise. I mean, that sounds bizarre, but if they're in fact worthy of praise, compensation, you know, whatever it might be that, that moral agents deserve for their work, that would be another great harm that we should have on our radar if in fact um, we're trying to weigh the costs and benefits. Thanks, Stephen. That's uh, the flip side. Yeah, I'll um, certainly consider that as, a, as a, an added reflection to this because I was a bit perhaps too negative in my concern that, you know, we, I suppose my negativity comes from the use of intelligence machines in warfare and so on. And of course, because I started my reflection with that sad incident of the work in Frankfurt. But in a sense, yeah, it's true. I mean, uh, we, uh, we run the risk of um, giving the praise to the machine instead of the manufacturers and the engineers and the people who use it. Thank you very much. It was a great talk. It was a great talk indeed, Pavar Caruana. Uh, very, very stimulating. And so thank you very much for it. Um, I would like to close by really thanking um, uh, the Jesuit community for their generosity in funding the Loyola cha Chair and in this way bringing us the, the richness of the work of the Jesuits across the world. Um, so thank you very much for that. Thank and thank you everyone for finding the time to attend and be with us. Um, Normally, we would now be um, grazing on some munchies and raising glasses, so, so, so I have to raise a, um, only a fictional glass. But I hope you do. Uh, I saw that there, there is a whole group in the Jesuit community uh, listening to you together, so I hope that you at least uh, get to raise a glass together. Congratulations and thank you. Thank you. <laughs>